A very warm welcome to you all. You're watching Channel 405. This is ANN7 Newsroom Live. I'm Lise Ho Mokonane. Minister of Public Enterprises Lynn Brown is presently at the ongoing parliamentary inquiry into allegations of mismanagement of state funds at uh, ESCOM. Let's go live. With the court, I conclude that Mr. Mulefi resigned and therefore was not dismissed as he has claimed. His reinstatement as CEO was premised on an invalid agreement. The 2016 Memorandum of Incorporation, which ought to have been applicable, was re rendered inapplicable by the reinstatement agreement. Chairperson, like most human beings I've heard of, there is some stuff I know, some stuff I don't know, and some stuff I should know but don't. Then my dealings with EFSCOM have taught me there is stuff I thought I knew because somebody had misinformed me and some stuff that is difficult to know because it is being actively concealed. Over the past eight or nine months, as more allegations have been leaked into the public domain, it has become increasingly apparent that I could no longer rely on information that ESCOM was supplying me. It began with the Brian Mulefi pension matter. Until then, the questions that I asked ESCOM had received plausible answers. But when I intervened to ask the board to come to a more appropriate arrangement, it opened a can of worms. It was at this point that I briefed my department to start working on the terms of reference for a special investigations unit probe into procurement and contract management to expose systemic challenges in ESCOM. I believe it is the most suitable agency to conduct this investigation. Uh, I hope that your cross-examination of witnesses, Ms. Daniels in particular, would add substance to the ever-grinding rumor mill. But the members of inquiry didn't seem particularly interested in pursuing the issue of Mr. Malefi's pension with Ms. Daniels. Soon after the pension debacle, the media published information that ESCOM had paid millions of rands to a company called Trillion. This information directly contradicted the response ESCOM, ESCOM had given me when the matter was raised in a parliamentary question in December 2016. The payments had not come to me for approval, so I was reliant on ESCOM for accurate information. It became clear that I had been manipulated into lying to Parliament. I demanded an explanation from ESCOM CFO, Mr. Anuj Singh. I subsequently instructed the board to institute an investigation into the matter. I believe that ESCOM deliberately lied to me about the trillion matter. It was not a matter that came to me at any stage for my approval. When I became aware of it through a parliamentary question, followed by immediate report, I took immediate corrective measures. Um, I think there were two people who signed off on the question, and they both are on suspension, so it will be on both their charge sheets. It is on both their charge sheets. I have been assured by the chairperson of the board. The optimum mine deal has been another of the pillars of the state capture narrative. It is alleged that former mine owner Glencore was deliberately squeezed by ESCOM so that Tegeta could buy the mine on the basis that the transaction did not meet the threshold of the significant and materiality framework agreement. I did not receive a request for approval of this deal in terms of section 54.2 of the PFMA. It was a matter within the authority of the Board of ESCOM and its executives in line with the governance framework within ESCOM. As a shareholder, I'm not privy to contract negotiations, but after the media picked up that ESCOM had radically reduced the penalty that forced Glencore to sell the mine in the first place, I asked DG Seleki to write to ESCOM to request details of the arbitration settlement. Ms. Daniels had already testified before the inquiry, inquiry on this matter, and I would urge the committee to solicit further information from her on the arbitration, the terms and conditions, and the process that led to the settlement. Now, colleagues, this is what I can
can only describe as a peculiar culture of closedness at ESCOM. I think it was deliberately set up that way in 1923. Its purpose was to supply abundant energy to industrialize the economy. A global recession was around the corner, that was the Great Depression, and ESCOM was identified as a buffer against white poverty and sanctuary of white economic aspiration. On the guaranteed cash flow from these special relationships and coal contracts with ESCOM, giant mining houses expanding their holdings and becoming really huge, ESCOM is continuing to service some of these apartheid era contracts today, 23 years into our democracy. These special relationships, conducted in a culture of secrecy and riddled with conflict of interest, included things like advanced payments and expedited payments because we are told mine development is expensive and ESCOM needed coal supply. Things we still see today. The culture of secrecy creates a perfect in environment for opportunism, cronyism, influence peddling and manipulation. It was designed that way. In this environment, access to members of the executive, the board or the ministry and the Department of Public Enterprises become a powerful calling card. Relationships that appear innocent may in fact be deeply co compromising or they may be perfectly legitimate, but due to individuals' soci association to others, they are perceived as compromise. Ladies and gentlemen, the other of the, another of the ESCOM names that have been much in the news is that of the man who acted as group chief executive after Mr. Mulefi's first departure, Mr. Machela Koko. Mr. Koko has been accused of alleged um, conflict of interest with respect to the awarding of a coal contract to the company his stepdaughter was in. When I appointed an interim chairperson and brought new blood onto the board following the resignation of Dr. Ngubani, my first instruction to the board was to institute investigations into Mr. Singh in respect of Trillian and Mr. Corko. I would like to plead with the committee to appreciate that ESCOM is a critical sock for the South African economy, and at times I am required to consider a different approach and put in place austerity measures in assisting the company to address its challenges. Therefore, in the other matters, I have been working closely with the board to assist them in managing the stability and continuity at, at the company. I do not dis regard this um, as interference with the board's functions. In observing the separation of roles between the board and shareholder, I cannot speak on behalf of the board on what actions are underway. Because I am not seen to be leading disciplinary processes which are the purview of the boards, doesn't mean that I'm sitting on my hands. State-owned companies are required to report to me on a quarterly basis on their operational sustainability as well as governance and leadership activities or challenges. As part of this reporting framework, I was provided a copy of the investigation report by Cliff Decker relating to the case of Mr. Corkle. My office identified serious gaps in the report, which were shared with the company secretary and head of legal, Ms. Daniels. Mr. Corco is presently suspended and his disciplinary hearing is underway. Do members of this committee honestly believe that what I've just described is fair or that is getting any closer to revealing the facts? I would like now to thank you for providing me the opportunity to make this presentation. I assume that I will be given an opportunity to pre present further information to the inquiry, should the inquiry gather further material requiring my response. Thank you. Thank you very much, Minister. We will then go to the evidence leader to lead us. Okay. 
thank you, Chair, and uh, thank you, Minister. Um, the, let's start with the relationship uh, between the shareholder representative yourself and the board. And that relationship is premised on trust. Will the minister agree with me on that? I agree with you, advocates. It would appear that the minister correctly relied on this trust relation between herself and ESCOM for some time. Yes, I always do. Until, of course, uh, people prove themselves that they are not trustworthy. That is so. Mackenzie has testified before the committee that ESCOM lied to them, that they had obtained treasury approval for the master service agreement. And they entered into an agreement, they performed work they were paid, and that they are prepared to pay a billion back because ESCOM had lied to them. It, with your experience with ESCOM, would you say that statement by Mackenzie that they lied to is far-fetched, ma'am? I, I wouldn't know if it was. Um, fabricated or not. But I do think that there is a, a, a level of secrecy at the company that is very difficult to get through to. You were also again put in a very compromising position by ESCOM when there was a question posed to you by your colleague in the assembly around the relationship between ESCOM, McKinsey, or Trillion Capital, or whatever Trillion, the word that was used. They must have put you in a very, very compromising position because uh, not, I mean, telling inaccurate information to Parliament uh, exposes one to criminal charges. Is that what the understanding of the Minister is? Absolutely. Um, I am both before the Public Protector as well as before the Ethics Committee because I've um, received that information from ESCOM. That uh, when the shareholder yourself, ma'am, trying to interact with ESCOM on a matter that concerns the nation, on the reappointment of Mr. Brian Molif, and you're asking questions of ESCOM, they're relying on legal opinions, and you're sourcing the opinion from them. It is not forthcoming. It doesn't end there, ma'am. It goes further that the interministerial committee, so over and above the shareholder representative, the cabinet decides to add more numbers to try and look into this particular transaction that concerns the nation, justifiably so. You are deprived, or the IMC is deprived of this legal opinion. What, what does it tell you about ESCOM? Um, I, well, it is that they would not uh, release a legal opinion. 
And um, at the time when I spoke with the chairperson, the then chairperson, about the legal opinion, he said that his um, legal advisor did not trust my, of my department and that eventually they can come and um, see this matter in, in her office. But um, she, you know, she, she was just never available for my legal, my legal department to be able to go there. So there has been many, many of those kinds of issues with ESCOM. And we've raised it with ESCOM constantly. Um, and of course, it always had a negative effect into the public space, um, on, the pu on the public generally. Um, and it is something that we're struggling, we do struggle with ESCOM. And that is part of the reason why I feel that there has to be an overreaching deep dive into a, an area of ESCOM's work so that we start lifting out the kind of culture that sits within the organization. My understanding is, um, okay, my knowledge, is that uh, you are in court on the issue of the dismissal of uh, Mr. Brian Molefe. And uh, I understand there is another court case where there are issues of pensions that are being challenged. And I get a sense that you've been following the proceedings, uh, of course, when you do get an opportunity. You, you might have seen the interaction I had last night with uh, Mr. Molife around he's stepping down. The, pers the, the, the perspective or your views around his departure is that uh, he resigned. Yes, sir. If it helps, it would appear to me that we agree, at least uh, in that respect, that uh, Mr. Molife resigned from ESCOM and his resignation was accepted not only by the board but by yourself. Well, I issued a statement to say so. And then, if, the, if he resigned, then there was, there could not have been the basis for him to come back to ESCO. Is that your understanding, ma'am? That is my understanding. On the issue of the pension that he received, I think he's considered, in all fairness, last night, that he wasn't entitled to the pension in hindsight. And of course, uh, naturally we expect that uh, at an opportune moment, the monies would then uh, be paid back. I want us to get back to this issue of board appointments, ma'am. At Transnet, or at ESCOM, sorry, there is a Mr. Mark Pamensky. And uh, at Transnet, there is a uh, A Mr. Is it is it Payne? I'm not sure now. But there's a 
there's a non-executive board member who heads the disposal acquisition and uh, disposal committee. You know them? I'm um, Shane. Yes, Shane. Yeah. As long as we, we, we understand. <laughs> Let's start with Mr. Mark Paminski. How did you get to, I know you've given the general process of uh, appointing uh, uh, board members, non-executive board members. But can you talk to uh, him specifically? Okay, was on the shortlist um, at the end of a process. Remember I told you that there were we put out an advert, um, people applied or they were nominated. Um, it goes through a verification process. Um, those who are shortlist, those who qualify generally. So it goes through a shortlist, and Mark Paminski was part of that. And um, eventually, um, Mark, they then deal with the issues of conflicts of interest, and my department raised a conflict of interest with a particular company. I can't remember the name of the company. Um, it was Blue something. Um, and he then, because that company did work with ESCOM, and, um, and that was right at the beginning. And the decision was that he either chose the company or he chose to recuse himself. Whenever that issue came up in the, and that was the right of, the, the right, he had that right. So he chose to recuse himself. The second issue, after he became a member of the ESCOM board, it was discovered that he then was also um, on um, Oak Bay. So when we discovered that, and there was the conversations and discussions happening around Tegeta, we then asked Mr. I asked Mr. I wrote him and I asked him to either resign or to step down. Mr. Paminski then decided to step down. It, it took a while because he felt he could recuse himself and he particularly wanted to recuse himself, but he eventually did step down. Um, so, Mr. P I, I can't remember the date that he stepped down, but he eventually stepped down. At the time when that happened, I then decided, because it, came, it was at the same time that um, I, at the same time, wrote to all the members. So, annually, I write to the members to ask them to declare their conflicts of interest, if anything. I now do it biannually, so that every six months members can declare their conflicts of interest if they have to. But Mr. Pominski joined Oak Bay after he became a member of the board of ESCOM. He's actually resigned from the board about a couple of months ago. I can't really remember the circumstances. He had no, there were allegations against Mr. Shane, like there were allegations against many other people um, that they had connections with um, the Gupta family or something. Um, just a random call from my part, on my part, um, two members of the board. I mean, one member said to me that I said, so you are linked to a particular minister and, um, um, and to a particular company, and therefore which company, uh, and I think it was, I knew that it wasn't her in the company, but is it linked to your husband? And she said to me, no, no, um, her husband doesn't have that company. Um, so in, in some respects, I, I think, 
the way I try to deal with it retrospectively is to try and get them to declare their conflicts of interest in biannually, as opposed to declaring it actually once a year. Um, and that's the way I try to deal with it. And when any conflicts of interest came up, I then responded to it immediately. And I gave them the option of resigning or staying in the company. Or, or me firing them. Sorry. Well, well, the non-exec you're talking about, uh, will that be Ms. Uh, Verushni Naidu? Okay. Oh, Ms. Klein, okay. It, it, it would appear, you see, Minister, I think part of, the, of this process needs to assist us going forward, fix the things. And I'm glad to pick out from your response that already there are certain experiences that suggest that some of the processes are not adequate enough. Um, and that you are now starting working towards those. The reputation, I just want us to deal with the issues around the reputation of, of ESCOM. Um, you, through your own personal experiences, um, there are certain factual things that you can attest to, just like others have their factual stories to attest to. Let's go back to the suspension of the four executives. Other than attend, there's a meeting on the 11th of March when you, are, when you join the board in an in-committee session. And the discussion centers around an investigation to be conducted or an inquiry which shouldn't take long, which you deal with in your statement. But there's a second element that the two non-executive directors that have testified, including Mr. Tsozi, deals with. And it relates to the suspension of the executives. What are you told at the meeting about the investigation as well as the suspensions? It was a Wednesday afternoon. I remember it very clearly. I just came out of a, a war room. The, we were in a very complex space, ESCOM. It was hardly, hardly a going concern. Um, there was load shedding. We just came out of a war room and um, it was again not adequate information. Um, the, uh, you know, it was always that we were never going to be able to see the next, through the next couple of days. In fact, the issue was that it was very clear that I felt at the time that the board has taken the reign of ESCOM. So I went to ESCOM that day and they had a, I didn't call a special general meeting or anything, I went to a meeting that they had. And when I arrived at the meeting, um, there were two matters, there were already matters on the table. There was a matter of the suspension of the four on the table already. It was already an agenda item. Um, and I wasn't 
particularly concerned about the four people being suspended or not. Um, I, I, I just wanted the company to be stable. But I, what I did want was to understand why we were spending so much more money on primary energy. We were now spending a billion rand a, mo a month on diesel. Um, there was no maintenance plan because in 2008 a decision was taken that we must keep the lights on um, irrespective in time for world, um, the World Cup and irrespective of what we do. And so there was no space to do maintenance. Um, the financially, we, the December of 2014, um, I was told by the um, CE that by January the 15th, we would not have money to pay the 45,000 workers at ESCOM. So we were in a very, very, very difficult position. And I wanted a deep dive into ESCOM. I wanted them, that's where the Denton's report comes from. I said, you've got to understand what the problems are and how we get out of these problems. And the board has to take the direction to deal with this. We have the war room, but there are competing interests in the war room as well. The responsibility still rests with me as the shareholder representative and them as the board. And that's what they had to do. At, the, at that meeting, I think the chair did say to me that they, he was going to suspend the four board members. I said, look, you do what you need to do, but what I want is the sustainability of the company. However we're going to create sustainability in this company, that is what we're going to have to do. And I left, I don't think I was there for a very long time, probably an hour, half an hour, an hour or so. But that's what I went to speak to the board. In fact, my department actually pushed me quite strongly on going to see the board, that I addressed the full board, because the board was not part of the war room, and they didn't know what was happening in the war room. So that I actually go and brief the company on the war, um, well, the board on the war room as well. And that's what I did. It appears that at this meeting, the board members were not particularly opposed to the investigation. No, they were not opposed to the investigation at all. In fact, the board members themselves were having, the board members themselves were having questions at the time. But that they were particularly concerned about the suspension, and I was always under the impression that uh, these four executives that were suspended, uh, were, the decision was taken in respect of all four of them at the board. Did you know, from, what, from your testimony, it would appear that uh, the board did explain to you of its intention to suspend the executives. Is that correct, ma'am? Yes, so. Were you furnished with the names? Um, I would imagine they would furnish me with the four names. Uh, Mr. Chorzi testified uh, earlier on in the day, and I know that you responded uh, to some of the allegations that uh, he made against you. That actually at that meeting there were three um, executives that were to be suspended. Mr. Koko, uh, Matona, and Morakane. And that it was actually at a people and governance subcommittee meeting where you had already left because you didn't sit, you didn't even spend uh, 
some time, a lot of time at the board meeting. But after lunch, immediately after lunch, that's the testimony of Mr. Tsotsi, is that uh, there was a people and governance subcommittee and Dr. Ngubana raised the name of Ms. Sulufelo Malife to add to the four directors. And when he challenged and asked questions around this, Dr. Ngubane indicated that you had proposed the name of Ms. Sulufelo to be added on the list. What is your response to that? I did not um, propose anybody's name. And that... Uh... Sorry, Advocate, I walked into my meeting with my officials and I walked out of the meeting with the officials. And that, uh, upon hearing this, he then made a telephone call to you. That is Mr. Tsozi, trying to understand why this name of <coughs> Molife was now added, because this name was not in the list he got from a meeting in Devon. And you insisted that uh, the name should be added on the list. What is your response to that? I, I must tell you, I have no, I don't think I would have ever put somebody's name on the list, um, Ms. Malefi's name onto the list. My view was that they should have a deep dive into the company, that the company should do what they think is the best way to take it forward, take, um, or take the company forward to create better sustainability, financial sustainability, as well as um, more regular maintenance and so forth. Um, I don't think I put a name on the, board, on the list. In a statement uh, right from in the beginning, you challenging uh, Mr. Zola's testimony. You say, before beginning my prepared statement, I would like to respond to Mr. Zola's accusations of an hour or two ago. And you're challenging that uh, you ever consulted uh, with anyone on your executive functions not Tony Gupta, Salimisa, or anyone else. In so far as board appointments, you report to cabinet, and cabinet decides who serves on boards. You also find it astonishing that Mr. Tsotsi found it appropriate to attend a meeting with the president without conferring with you before the meeting, no bothering to share with you the outcomes of the meeting, of his engagement with the president. I think this morning I had also tried to test these issues with Mr. Tsozi, or some of them, not all. But what is missing from your response to Mr. Tsozi's testimony is that you had that telephone conversation with him and that you insisted that Ms. Molife's name be added on the list. If we are to believe you <coughs> that uh, indeed you did not insist on Molife to be added on the list, why are you challenging that in a statement? Um, well, I have to be very frank with you that I was not, I didn't actually hear Mr. Cho, um, Zola Tsotsi's um, statement. I um, was in a meeting and my staff um, said, oh, something's happened. And they went out to look at what is happening. And that was the only thing that we saw. I didn't see the issue about um, 
uh, Ms. Mulef is, um, that her name should be added. So uh, that was the only matter that was raised. And I mean, I thought it was nonsense. So I said, issue a statement. And we made, tried to make a decision where I would issue the statement and I, we decided that we'll issue, make the statement here. Um, that's the only thing that I actually heard um, from what the staff was telling me in the room that I, we were sitting in. I didn't actually know that he said this. I wasn't listening to him, sorry. But what is your response to that? Did you or did you not give Tsulufelo's name over to Dr. Ngubane to add to the list. Did not. That, that, that's, that's all that I wanted to find out. So Mr. Tsotsi was again lying. The fact that I did not and he said I did uh, means that one of us is lying and I don't think I'm lying. The, you, you, so when did you know that uh, the four names were to be suspended? Was it after the announcement or prior to the announcement? I remember that Mr. Sotsi actually called me quite late the night after the meeting that they had to tell me that that's the decision that they, were, they have taken and that they were going to make an announcement the next day. At least now we know that evening that Tsotsi phoned you, you knew that one of the people to be suspended was the finance director. That is so. I, I'm, I must tell you that I only know of four people who were going to be suspended. He was one of the four. But I asked earlier on whether whilst you were at the meeting where you were told that uh, there were executives to be suspended, whether the names were furnished to you, and you said they might have been. I said that they must have given me the names. I'm not absolutely sure if they gave me the names, but they must have given me the names. But they did say that they were suspending um, management. And, and in those four, and it, there was a finance director, and as a shareholder, knowing the Impact. I think in your statement you do allude to the effect of the negative publicity around ESCOM and the investor confidence in ESCOM and other SOEs. When you heard that one of the finance directors is to be suspended, did that not uh, concern you, ma'am? I was concerned that all four were going to be suspended, but I was also concerned that the company was in, the company was almost not a going concern at the time. So if this was the way to get the company to be operational and fully operational, then yes, I would like them to do whatever it is, that whatever it will take to get it fully operational. And I, 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 must be, I must tell you that part of the issue was, I knew it, because they were reporting into the war room at the time. And part of the issue was that we were having lots of um, information that was not um, clear, it was not accurate, uh, and it was really about the information that was coming from ESCOM. And more importantly, ESCOM was just in dire straits. 
So whatever it took to actually bring the company to stability was what I wanted. I wanted them to understand what it is that they were going to have to do, do a deep dive into ESCOM, and that was the one thing. And the second thing is they raised the fact that um, they wanted to suspend these executives. Whatever it took, I wanted the company to be... Um, um, ESCOM's a monopoly. If anything happens to this company, then we are all in trouble. So, I mean, for me, that was the most important thing at the time. I don't think uh, the board or um, my line of questioning is not necessarily on the reason for the investigation. But it is around the suspension of these four executives. What, what is the reason given to you, if any, for the suspension of these executives? Some of the reasons were actually the reasons that I've raised with ESCOM. I raised with them, information is not um, forthcoming. Information is not accurate. There is no plan at ESCOM to get us out of this mess. There is no plan to create, um, uh, to ensure financial sustainability of the company. It was around the time that we were also working towards the 23 billion rand bailout. There wasn't going to be a bailout if we, so we had three governing th um, structures over ESCOM. We had the I IMC on um, energy, which was chaired by me and the finance minister at the time, myself, and the energy minister participated in it. And that was to look at the 23 billion rand um, bailout for ESCOM. But to bail out a company who had no plan to the future was not, it was just not, it didn't make sense. So, I mean, those were all the reasons that were given at the time. The, the people who took the decision to suspend, you didn't take the decision. The minutes show you told them they must do what they had to do. But you did not, and nobody has testified that you gave a decision for people to be suspended. Now, the people who suspended are on record, at least the three of them, Mr. Tsotsi, uh, Ms. Klein and Ms. Naidu, that there was no reason for the suspension of the executives. All that had to be done was to proceed with an investigation, but remove them from the company so that they do not interfere with the investigation. Was this relayed to you? I, I vaguely remember that they said that they were wanted to remove them from the company so that they could proceed with the investigation. Now, the absent any b r uh, evidence of wrongdoing on this executive, particularly the finance director, Mr. Tsotsi was at pains this morning to explain to the committee how he tried bitterly to fight the suspension, at least of the finance director, because of what he had anticipated to have been a massive response from the markets and the investors. And he's testified that uh, he's... Uh, he's... Um, Reservations or concerns were later on realized when, she, when he had to field 52 inquiries. Did this not bother you, Minister? Well, you know what happened after the four um, people, because that's, that's what happened afterwards when they were suspended was that, um, amongst other things, um, 
ISKCON was downgraded, and one of the reasons given, there were about three or four reasons given for the downgrade, was the suspension of the management. And you, you see, Ben, it, it is the, the effect of this uh, suspension that concerns me. Uh, to, to ESCO, and the net effect thereof going to uh, the consumers of the product of ESCO, which is electricity. Mr. Tsotsi, who is the chairperson, has, does anticipate that the removal or the suspension of this finance director is going to bring us problems. Did you not foresee this coming, ma'am? No, the, it wasn't just the suspension of the um, financial director. It was actually the suspension of all four that brought us um, the downgrade, because if that's the problem that you're speaking about, then that's actually the issue. Did, did you not foresee the downgrade coming? Because Mr. Tsozo seemed to have seen it coming. Well, we all saw the downgrade coming. Because by this time, the company, as I said earlier, was hardly a going concern. It was waiting for a bailout of 23 billion rand. It had no plan, visible plan going forward, um, low staff morale, a whole range of things. So I, I realized um, and it, the speculation was rife in the media at the time that ISCOM was going to get um, a downgrade. What I didn't realize at the time was that one of the reasons for the downgrade, so I expected a downgrade for ISCOM, because we actually, um, I mean, just not being a going concern is a problem. Um, but more importantly, I didn't expect that, the, that it would be because, that one of the four reasons would be um, the issue of um, the four managers who were suspended. And, and two of those uh, are people that you would directly be appointing, uh, the FD and the group chief executive, is that correct? So I appointed the group chief executive, and I met the FD there. And you, you, you should, uh, although you didn't take the decision to suspend, you're the shareholder, you knew about this, you could have anticipated uh, the consequences of these suspensions. Do you think that you could have done better, ma'am? Venara, I think you, you probably don't realize what, I mean, I, I'm probably not clear enough about it, um, but we were in a very, very, very difficult position as ESCOM at the time. In fact, it was probably um, we were on stage three load shedding. And if you get to stage four load shedding and there's a blackout, then an area like Gauteng or an area like um, KZN or um, Cape Town, if there was any load shedding, it will take two weeks. For the, if there was any blackout, it would take two weeks for it to be revived. You know, after 17 hours of blackout, you can't revive your economy again. And I was really panic-stricken. It was probably the most panicked, I felt the most panicked about ISCOM at the time. Because the crisis that we were experiencing, and it didn't seem as if the crisis, if you remember, I once said in the House that for the next three years, please prepare for load shedding. Go and buy your generators, go and buy 
your solar lights and so forth. Prepare for load shedding because we, we will never, we will not make up the backlog of maintenance in the next three years. So we were in a, actually in a crisis. So in some regards, I felt that if it meant that this, with the management going and the uh, being shift aside for the deep dive to understand what we need to do, um, and whether I affect the whole country and continue to affect the whole country by load shedding, um, and the economy took such a knock. In fact, um, the number that was um, given at the time was that it cost the country about 400 odd million per day for load shedding. So just that crisis alone that we were going through, I just wanted a solution for it. And, that's, and so in some respects, I, I'm always sad when people have to go. Um, but they were suspended, they were, just remo they were just suspended, they were not fired out of the company. I think three of them, one came back, and three of them decided to take um, um, packages or processes, discussions with um, ESCOM. In none of it, um, I mean, I, would, I don't want to see people going. I really do not want to see young black um, professionals being moved aside um, because of um, anything. But I really did, I really must tell you that there was a crisis in the country at the time. And that is what actually um, made me accept the fact that the four um, would be suspended. Um, I wanted to understand it content-wise. What is it that made, that created this? And can you go and find a deep dive investigation? In fact, I gave them three months in which to do it. Go and find out what is happening so that we can actually find a solution for it. And I only gave them three months in which to do the deep dive. You can't do a deep dive into ESCOM in three months but just to understand what was happening was actually the most important for me at the time. And I might have made a mistake in the process of allowing four people to be removed, but that wasn't the intention. The bigger intention for me was what was important for the 54 million people in this country. Now, I hear you, Minister. See, so the, the focus is not so much or only on just the mere suspension. It is the inherent consequences that flow with the suspension for both the individuals partly, but most importantly for the company. So was there no better way to would have handled this thing instead of suspending people or bringing them on board, trying to talk to them and explain to them in the manner in which you're explaining now? Because I don't think then people would have started to run to the CCMA, to the Labour Court, like Mr. Matona did, run to the CCMA to, to fight something that seems to have been a, a non issue. I think I spoke with them very, very often. The war room met weekly. And every week when I saw them, I raised this issue with them. Um, there was no plan for ESCOM at the time. I, I want, you know, this is, this is um, something that if there was a plan, I probably wouldn't have um, felt this way. There might have been a better way of doing it, but and not suspending the four people. 
Um, I don't know. It's three years ago. Um, when the suspensions were, I think eventually I said you can't, I mean the labor law um, doesn't make provision for an unending suspension. But the one person came back and that was Mr. Um, Machela Coco. And the other three took the packages. At that stage, it was, I suppose, all they've lost trust in the in the company. Um, as I said, there isn't. It wasn't an easy one, but it it happened that way. And of course, I'm sorry that we lose um, four, three at the time. Um, good, young. Um, professionals. I mean, and it, it, it can never be taken lightly or easily, um, especially in a period like uh, the last 10 years where we can't really afford to have people walking the street. Just, just on that note then, Minister, you, you seem to be sorry about what happened. Do I get it correctly? I'm sorry that young people have lost their, jo jo their jobs. I, I do think that immediately after that, we started seeing a bit of light. Remember, the board came to me. They told me that they wanted to bring somebody who understood, and I'm now moving away from your topic, but I will happily go back to it. But um, a little, I think it was months after that, when load sh shedding stopped, the plan, there seemed to be a plan, um, there was better cohesion in the company, um, and so forth. So yes, I'm sorry about the fact that young people, because, um, well, you know, they may be not young people, but youngish people were, were suspended. I can't help that they didn't come back to the company. Um, when they, you know, um, one person did come back, three didn't come back. In December 2014, you changed your board. Can you share with the committee why that happened during that period? Because my understanding is that uh, you would normally consider rotating or changing your board around uh, just immediately after your AGM, which is around July, August, or June, July, or August. Actually, no, it's not true. Um, um, I normally change, in fact, I became minister in May 2014. And I think at the AGM, um, I decided being the, um, I, I just want to find, in fact, you can also find it, it's in E. Um, e in, the, in the, the pack, the board pack. I, I want to speak about that. I held an AGM of ESCOM on the 11th of July 2014. I approved a resolution to reappoint, to the reappointment of all non-executive um, directors pending the board composition review within five months to give me an opportunity to consider the current board. Um, and if you remember, and I, I'm doing this anecdotally now. It was in a period where the decision was being made. Um, it's something else I was blamed for. Um, the decision was being made at, es at um, um, Kuburg um, for Westinghouse or Arriva to get the contract. It was a contract that was in the pipeline for three years. And um, there was a lot of conflict on the board um, at the time. 
Two non-executive members, uh, Ms. Latuli and Ms. Masutela, resigned during October 2014. Now, we do this review process with the board, so it's an internal review where the board reviews itself. But then there's also an external review of the board. And we make decisions based on um, the board. But on the 11th of September, Cabinet approved the support package. That's the 23 billion rand support package that I spoke about earlier. And the package is mainly aimed at strengthening ESCOM's position to remain a going concern. That was the reason why the 23 billion rand was allocated to ESCOM. Um, but one of the critical areas of concern raised by Cabinet related to the quality of leadership in ESCOM both at the board and at the executive level. So, I actually, being the shareholder representative in consultation with Cabinet, I had the prerogative to appoint or reappoint or rotate um, directors on the board. Accordingly, I, I rotated um, nine of the board members and kept two as non-executive directors for the purposes of continuity and institutional memory. Um, that I did in December. So I kept the two, that was Mr. Tsotsi and um, Ms. Trita Mabude. I kept those two on for, um, and I, I, I rotated the rest of the board. But there was a lot of conflict in the board at the time. And I'm, I raised the issue about Westinghouse and Arriva. There was a lot of conflict in the public space um, at the time. In fact, one of the media houses wrote that I influenced the change of, or I changed the name of the company that eventually won the contract. And many months later, the court ruled on that matter. So, um, so the conflict in, within the board was e extremely um, untenuous. The Denton's report. ESCOM seems to be not coming forward with the unedited version. And this is a report that you must have been patiently awaiting for, because this is the report that would have provided uh, possible solutions to what were, must have been giving the minister sleepless nights. Are you concerned that uh, ESCOM doesn't want to share this report with the public? the report, the final report. There were drafts before that. Um, I don't see the drafts. I get the final report. I got the final report and I said it in my statement somewhere on the 7th of September, I think 2016 or 2015. Um, the, the issues in the Denton's report, and there are many reports in ESCOM, so you must bear with me. Um, I think the issue in the Denton's report largely related to um, the primary um, cost of um, um, energy. It related to the build program. And remember we were behind schedule and we having cost overruns. ESCOM was having cost overruns. Um, so just the two issues have been resolved. I think ESCOM spends about 200 million a year now on um, diesel, and that's just to fire the Ankerlicht and um, what's it called? Horikwa. 
um, the two diesel plants in the Western Cape. So they just, to, to fire it up now and then so that it doesn't break down, um, they spend about 200 million rand. So that's been resolved, and that came out of the Denton's report. The second, there were about eight issues that came out of the Denton's report. The second issue was the cost overruns. Um, um, ESCOM, we've, look, we've had cost overruns for years and years and years. In fact, the amount of money paid is enormous, um, on especially Medupi and Kusile. Um, the lagging behind of the build program, especially Medupi and Kusile, they've um, reset times and they've come in time of the reset times. So. We now have two units up and running in Medupi and one unit up and running in Kusile and one that goes to synchronization in Kusile. So six of the eight um, areas in the Denton's report has been resolved. But what I do know is that there are all these other draft reports that mentions people's names and so on. Now those reports I don't get. I just get the final report. And if um, I've, I've offered the portfolio committee before when I was in the portfolio committee that ESCOM should present to the portfolio committee the Denton's report. And the portfolio committee should arrange it. I just want to get back to the reputation of ESCOM. I think I must have raised this thing earlier on, but I didn't follow it up. Before you appointed, uh, and this is now after the departure of Mr. Molife, you appointed uh, Mr. Koko as acting group chief executive. Mm -hmm. This is uh, after he was exposed to have uh, not been an honest person uh, on television, and understand uh, had a fight, uh, not a fight, had an intense discussion with Miss uh, Klein yesterday. They appear to have also had uh, a number of issues against uh, Mr. Coco when they recommended them, when they recommended him to you, and some they didn't disclose. What did you think of that appointment uh, in respect of the reputation of ESCOM? So when the board um, appoint, um, said that they wanted to, they had two names to offer me um, for, to stand in as a acting CE, I accepted Mr. Corco's name at the time. Um, you know, I do believe that somebody, even though they are exposed on TV or exposed in the newspaper or exposed in somewhere, I do think people must be charged and they must be found guilty. And then, and they must be found guilty in whatever they, whatever they do for them not to be um, held liable. So Mr. Koko at the moment is before a disciplinary hearing. Now there's a, there's a popular rumor going around that I don't want Mr. Koko to be fired. I actually asked, in fact, um, Dr. Ben, Mr. Koko didn't want to step aside in the, um, what's this company that his daughter's in, in the Impulse Trading Company. I actually went to speak to Mr. Corker to tell him to please step aside so that the investigation can take place. And as soon as we appointed the new board, I actually said to the new board that the first two things, and this is an interim board that has been appointed, that the first two things that they must do is deal with Mr. Corker and Mr. Singh. If I compare the 
man, I wish you were happy or understood for those three senior executives or four to go. And I look at the manner in which uh, you want to give Mr. Koko an opportunity to be find, first found to have done something. I understand that fully. But did the reputation, the reputational damage to the company not matter? Tweeting brought a lot of reputational damage to the company. I mean, I banned him many times from... But you are absolutely right. I have... Um, it has caused um, reputational damage to the company. If it caused then reputational damage, uh, ma'am, I at least uh, prepare to concede that because you appointed him, you should take uh, responsibility for that reputational damage to the company? Well, I have to take reputational damage to the company anyway, for anything that, it, that happens in the company. It sits in my portfolio. I do take that reputational damage. In fact, um, um, I don't really have an option on it. But there are those that you could uh, anticipate and uh, prevent from them realizing. There are those that you cannot, you do not have control over them. But there are those that at least you could take steps to prevent them. I actually think it's a bit of an esoteric debate that you are having with me. Um, because in, in essence, how would I know um, somebody uh, accuses, um, the board gives me two names. Um, the one person is be dealing with an issue, and I remember this very specifically. The one person is dealing with the municipal debt. I don't want to shift anybody from municipal debt at this stage. I mean, it's this board, not this one, the previous board, that actually took the decision to rake in the municipal debt. That was the first time that we actually started taking municipal debt seriously. And it's the previous board that um, um, proposed the name of Mr. Corkle to me. And there was no reason for me not to accept the name at the time. Let's go, ma'am, because I need to give the honourable members an opportunity to interact with you. Around your accountability responsibility to Parliament. We've now gone through this discussion of ours, and it will appear, and in your statement you also admit that there are problems at ESCOM and that they need to be attended to. My differ how you would uh, want the problems addressed. Do you find your constitutional responsibility to account uh, to Parliament as a source of grave irritation? Not at all. I think it's captured in the Constitution that the executive is held accountable to Parliament through the legislature. And I do not at all feel it's a grave irritation. Knowing these uh, challenges that are at ESCOM and some SOEs that the committee has taken a decision to inquire into, have you what have you done to try and assist the committee, this committee, in uh, unearthing and getting to the bottom of some of the challenges? Because I understand you're sitting with the Bowman's report, you sit with the Denton's report, you sit with the report that the company secretary prepared for you, 
uh, around uh, some of the things that are happening at ESCOM, some of which have led to the suspension of executives, including Mr. Koko and uh, Mr. Singh. I just want to correct something. Are you asking me to report to CAB to um, that? Are you asking me to provide a way of reporting to um, the parliament, parliamentary committee on all of these reports? I'm delighted to do so. The, I'm sorry, Ben. You, you and Parliament seem to have identified a problem at least at ESCOM, at uh, Transnet and Denel, at least that's Parliament's, uh, this inquiry, this focus. And at least in respect of ESCOM, we've now jetted through our discussion, it does appear that you have a sense of problems that needs to be unearthed at ESCOM. I guess my question is, what have you done, now that you know your colleagues are seized with the matter of getting to the bottom of this. You might not agree with the manner in which they've chosen to conduct uh, this thing. What, what have you done to be of assistance to this committee? I'm actually not sure how to answer your question. What have I done to be of assistance to the committee? Whatever the committee asked me for, I gave them. Um, in terms of, I do want to say something about the company secretary's report, because I think you have raised that report here too now. The issue is that the company secretary does not report to me. The board reports to me. The company secretary cannot give me a, docu a document directly to myself. She must give it to me, the board must give it to me. So the board has to have oversight over the report before it comes to me. But I'm very, I'm, what I've done for, for ourselves to try and get into, especially ESCOM and Transnet, the detail of what is happening in the companies um, and um, also because the Auditor General has actually raised the issue of procurement and contract management, and because that is actually what is in the public space the most. It is the issue of procurement and contract management in ESCOM and Transnet. I have actually um, uh, um, called for a, well, for the SIU, um, investigation into the company because I can't sit on my hands while I know that there are problems within ESCOM and Transnet, especially around procurement and contract management. Um, and the, the, the process of the SIU investigation is, is in within the process now, I believe it is with Mr. Minister Masuta. When you mem write to Parliament, which has decided to conduct this inquiry, and you ask questions such as these, the authentic, what, what are the, the authenticity of the emails on the public space? Could, they, could, their, verif could their veracity be relied on? In what context are you asking this question? If you don't mind, I just want to find my letters as well. Um, which letter is that you are referring to, Senior Council? I mean, it, it is your letter of the 13th of October 2017. 
Oh, the 13th of October. Yes. In this, okay. In this letter, you asked uh, more than 10 questions. But I just need to, to focus on uh, the one that I've asked around the authenticity of the emails. Yes, I, I did ask you the question. Um, what's, your answer, what's your question on my question? I'm very conscious of the fact that Parliament didn't write back to me, but I... No, I, I, that's one of the things that perhaps we need to correct, because there is a letter that the chairperson wrote back to you on the 20th of October 2017 responding to that letter of the 13th. But before we get there, we'll get there, I'm just asking you what, when you ask Parliament, what, what is what, the authenticity of the emails on the public space, could their veracity be relied on? What do you have in mind when you ask this question? Just exactly that, can be rely on the veracity. I mean, I, I, I would like, I've never seen the emails. Um, I have heard, for example, that um, um, this has happened with my DG, and I've seen a letter in the newspapers, or I've seen it in the newspapers, or I've seen it in outer. Um, and then I've seen that there was 10 days of um, the emails being available. I couldn't, I tried to um, click onto it, but I could never get into it. But I, so that was just the question that I asked. You, you see, the, what, what it comes across, at least to me, and I'm glad you raised the issue of your DG, is that your DG comes out of these emails as somebody whose CV had gone to a Mr. Duduzane Zuma before he got to be appointed as your DG. And you seem particularly interested on the authenticity of the emails. Is that not a defensive approach to this inquiry? Not particularly. When you ask the question, how do we deal with information that implicates the department from other witnesses? What about the fundamental right of not implicating oneself? What, what informs this question, Minister? One of the witnesses said that everybody, I have 230 members in my department. I employ 230 professionals in my department. And when one of your witnesses say that there are 230 people in the department who are captured. I sh must ask the question, what informs that? And so that is what informs um, that question. Because it's, it's, it's almost implicating, if I were to agree to the question, to, to, I mean, if I were to... Um, If I were to, nobody cross-questioned the witness when they said the, when the witness said, yes, the whole department is captured. Um, my 230 staff members, young professionals, are captured. There's no proof of it. So I have to protect my staff as well. So, so. If there's any proof of anything, I'll be very happy to um, deal with the staff. So in the midst of uh, the problems, the minister is not concerned about uh, assisting a process to get to the root of the problem. The minister is interested in protecting the officials. No, I'm interested in doing all of it. I'm interested in getting down to, if I wasn't interested in getting to the root of the problem, I would not have been 
myself gone into and had an investigation into um, ESCOM and Transnet. I would have just left it because nobody else has gone into a deep dive into ESCOM and, and, and um, Transnet. And I think this is not something that's happened now. This is the way the companies have worked over years and years and years. They do business with each other. I mean, with the company, or the officials do business with the company. Um, there's a huge company that has a devolved supply chain management process that probably has masses and masses of kickbacks in it. Every day there are whistleblowers saying so-and-so. You just have to read about it. So there's just a lot of things. If I didn't feel that I have to deal with whether there's looting in the company and try to protect my staff, I have to do all of it. I have to try to protect myself. I have to try to fix what's happening in the companies. I wouldn't have called for an SIU investigation at all. I want to do all of it. I need to have a staff, a human capital that will actually help to provide the oversight over these companies. But if there is any wrongdoing, I'm happy to hear that wrongdoing. And if it's proven, I will deal with the staff. It, so you, you, you will protect your officials from other investigations and uh, you, unless you do the investigation yourself. Is that what you say? No, not at all. I, I do not say that at all. In fact, I am happy for whoever does the investigation. The police, the hawks, anyone. The parliamentary committee, anyone. But fair chance, must be a fair process, it must, um, for anybody in this whole 54 million people, it must be fair. That's how I feel about it. The, the other question that I find, I find uh, a bit disturbing is uh, when you ask what are pa what are the powers of parliament to subpoena? Or could parliament enforce such subpoenas? What is it that you don't want parliament to get? The question. That's all. Parliament, I'm just asking you the question. So parliament is busy trying to get to the bottom of the rot that you know about, of its existence, you might, not know, you might not know the details. You're doing nothing to help Parliament to get to the bottom of these things. All you do is to throw questions that appear to be directed and aimed at concealing evidence to the inquiry. What do you say about that, ma'am? True. The point is, I will use whatever means to ensure a fair and a just hearing. If there's anything Parliament needs from me to help them with the investigation, you just need to ask me for it. But otherwise, fair and just hearing is what I have asked of Parliament. What is the interface between the parliamentary inquiry and other investigations by other organs like the SIU and the Public Protector? Is this a minister who is trying to assist a committee seized with something that concerns the entire country? The only question I'm asking you there, Advocate, is will this, or can this, report help to assist any of the other investigations? 
Why are you so concerned, one, about how Parliament gets to access the documents? Why are you, why are you concerned that Parliament is going to use the hashtag Gupta Leaks? How, why are you concerned that Parliament is uh, going to deal with what is before the courts? Why, why, is all, why are all of these questions coming up, which do not seem to be assisting your colleagues in getting to the problems at ESCO? I, I repeat, if there are any questions or any documents that my colleagues would like to have, they must please advise what it is. They would get it, or they can get it from the companies, or they can get it in whichever way they'd like to get it. The issue is, Honourable um, Venara, why are you so concerned that I use whatever legal recourse I can? I will do so. I will protect and I will use, I, I want a fair process. I want to ensure that there's a fair process. And so I've never thought that I can't write to you or I can't write to the chairperson on any of these matters. The fact that these letters are leaked and goes into the media and, you know, and I'm umpired out because of it is a consequence of it, but that's just a consequence. I can use any powers given to me by our Constitution to direct any question at you, as you have to direct any question at me. No, I fully agree, ma'am. You are entitled to raise the questions that you've raised. These questions are not in a context that suggests that you could not have reasoned, you could not have reasoned the question. The problem that I have with the questions that you are raising is twofold. Your colleagues announce an inquiry into your portfolio. You seem to be aware that there are challenges. You might perhaps for whatever reason uh, not like how they're going to do it. But the fact is they've taken a decision. What is absent, what I don't see you do, in all of this, I don't see an active minister who is happy that his or her, her colleagues are going to assist her to get to the bottom of the problem. What I see is a behavior of a minister who is very obstructionist because He's asking all of these questions, it would appear, for the sake of asking questions, not for the sake of assisting the committee. That is, why, that is where I am, ma'am. That is why we're having this engagement. You find me obstructionist. I must tell you that I feel that I've used what legal recourse and constitutional recourse was available to me to ask you questions, and I'm sorry that you found that obstructionist. In all three letters that I've written to you, it was letters asking you of clarity. Whatever the issues were, it was asking you for clarity. But I'm really sorry that you found me obstructionist about it. I didn't intend to be obstructionist. I, if I said to you in all three letters, I didn't write them to you though, but I said in all the letters that I must tell you that I am very willing to participate in this. And so I've expressed my willingness to participate. I've expressed my willingness, and I, and I again express my willingness to participate, and just being here today is a willingness to participate. Um, but, I mean, I've not intended to be obstructionist at all. 
but I am going to be obstructionist now. I would like to have a comfort break chair, because I can't actually sit here anymore. <laughs> I must go pee. Okay, I need a comfort break. I, I, I thought of a comfort break just after the questions of, 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 of Mr. Vanara, but I, if, if you need, if you can't hold it now, you can go. You can go, Minister, you can go. And that's the scenes from Parliament in the Portfolio Committee for Public Enterprises. Minister Lynn Brown uh, was uh, presently undergoing a parliamentary inquiry into allegations of mismanagement at state-owned entities and zooming in primarily into uh, ESCOM. And we joined in studio by Tsepo Khadima and Zamo Mandala uh, from uh, the Radical Economic Transformation Coalition. And Sebo Khadima is an energy expert and political analyst. We'll, we'll dip in and out of this particular uh, presentation or inquiry, Re Khadima. But very briefly, Minister has now taken a comfy break. We know it's been a, a protracted and elaborate uh, process. Just your observation so far in her de de uh, deposition. Well, I think the, the challenge is that there isn't so much of a nexus between the testimony that is led in terms of the various witnesses. So they, they effectively the inquiry is um, flip-flopping, it's moving from one side to the other. So it, it becomes very difficult to even understand what kind of a report or finding they are going to be able to produce and of what effect it is going to be. But as I've been looking at this inquiry and just think it reminded me of what uh, uh, the 17th uh, Labor Secretary of the United States uh, uh, Jay Donovan said that when all of this is over and the truth emerges, which office will one have to go to to get their reputation back? And I think the many people who have been effectively accused by innuendo and conjecture without any recourse whatsoever, because some of them have not even been called to go before this inquiry. The witnesses that have been testifying and making wild allegations have not been uh, cross-examined in any shape or form. So effectively, the laws of natural justice have been suspended. The question then that has to be asked is that when the truth finally emerges, these people who have been tarnished, their images, which office do they, will they go to to go and get their reputation back? And I'm telling you here that uh, we are finding that people here, they are effectively being put through the mud, but they are expected to go and pay for their own dry cleaning, and that cannot be acceptable. Mm. Uh, and Minister Lynn Brown had made uh, the uh, same claims, that it seems like a kangaroo court or a witch hunt, that this particular inquiry had a predetermined outcome. And uh, if there is no opportunity to cross-examine witnesses, people essentially can get away with whatever it is uh, that, that pops up. Uh, at the top of their minds. Well, um, good evening to the viewers. Um, I happen to have been fortunate to have seen um, a bit of Mr. Tsotsi's own testament earlier on today. And now listening to what Minister Brown is putting, those two, if we were to take them into any court of law, need cross-examination because at the end of the day, somebody must be lying. You can't have polar opposites of, of the truth and they're, they're both true. So at the end of the day, the parliamentary process, and even the parliamentarians themselves have said it, it will not have any legal consequences. But what I foresee is that there are those who have, like Mr. Tote, I don't know if he had taken advice to look at Section 76 to 78 of the Companies Act and the fact that he is still today liable for those acts if they were against the interests of the company. I don't know how seriously he takes his fiduciary duty, but for a man of his experience, I would have expected that he would have at least have been advised not to perjure himself within the hearing, because there's a lot he put out there on the basis of innuendo, 
and suggestions without there being corroborative facts that can be put on the table. Yeah, he did, he did talk about the meeting, though, around Tony Gupta, um, and, you know, the minister came out saying she refutes that particular claim of having a link with the Guptas. So why would he lie under oath? Look, I think after today's testimony, it's going to be exceedingly difficult for Mr. Zola Zotzi to continue to be a fit and proper person to be a director of a company. So effectively, the words that are used... And the New Companies Act of 2008 is a lot more specific and a lot more punitive. The words that are used that the duty of skill and care. So first and foremost, it is taken as a given that when you assume position of a director and most of a director of the size of the company that is, you have got the requisite skills to be able to navigate through the maze of issues that would face such a director on a daily basis. And then the duty of care, and it's a duty both of them, duty of skill and care. The duty of care is that the moment you are aware that there is any harm that can accrue from whatever action that you are seeing there, you must take corrective action. So the question that he has not been able to address adequately is precisely what constrained him if his allegations are to be taken to be factual and correct and true, what then constrained him from exercising the duty of care, which is a duty he had no other choice but to have to discharge? Mm. What constrained him? So therefore, from, from, from today's testimony, I cannot see how he will continue to be. In fact, he stands to be uh, effectively disqualified uh, or to be uh, uh, found to be a delinquent director, which in turn means that he can never serve in any other board of any other company anywhere else. The question that must be asked is as a, exactly why would he take uh, a, 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 such a risk? Because the duty for him to have acted is not today in testifying before this inquiry, the duty to have acted and taken corrective uh, remedial action in his capacity as a director of a company that important with the duty imposed upon him as Mr. Mandela is saying in terms of the Companies Act, that duty was at that very moment that these allegations, which unless otherwise he would have adduced substantive documentary evidence, they stand to be regarded as uh, nothing but preposterous allegations by those he has made against. But he himself, I can't see how he will hold course on really being a fit and proper person to be a director of a company. But it doesn't absolve the minister because he does uh, make claims of her inter alleged interference into board appointments or his work micromanaging SOEs and primarily when it comes to the relationship. At that very uh, moment, the, the, at that the, very moment the, the issue is this, why, why would you take an unlawful instruction? To, the interference is talking about interference is not even intervention because intervention would be legally provided for interference it means it's unlawful therefore the moment that he received an unlawful instruction why did he act on an, an a, in, a unlawful instruction simply put it therefore means that if he couldn't discern at the time that this was an unlawful instruction which he should not have carried through it therefore means it confirms if anything it makes it already untenable position, it aggravates it, if anything. And, and he should never even have confessed the things that he did because, <coughs> unfortunately, he, you know, he, 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 uh, I think he, that pejoring of himself meant that, you know, he's going to go into the wilderness. Mm. But the, the counter-arguments and allegations just mean it's almost like we're chasing our tail, that there isn't a particular um, outcome besides a collation of events that transpired and witnesses that, that came forward. For, for it to be meaningful, Zamo, in, in your view, uh, and to restore the dignity of those that have been falsely implicated uh, and those uh, that were found to have done wrong, to be punished accordingly, what, what in your view would have been a, a more adequate or efficient way of doing this? I, I believe the reality takes us back to the state of capture inquiry that the president has himself acceded to and said he will make happen. Because there you're going to have a judge and I, I don't understand why people say the president is not yet, um, is, is no longer capable of choosing an independent judge. Currently we've got the Essendimeni thing going on and I believe it's former Chief Justice um, Mosenenke handling that and I think people are pretty satisfied with his caliber. Judge Mohueng was seen as a, 
Azuma Ali until he ran the Constitutional Court independently and it, it, it has even found against the president. So I don't understand on what basis anyone in South Africa is attacking judges as a whole. Because when you say the president cannot appoint an independent judge, it is an insult on the entire judiciary. It's much less about the president. It's one saying that the judiciary is not independent in this country and is therefore, you are insinuating it is captured by the president by default, which is just a load of nonsense to really be polite. At the end of the day, the one thing that will set, set us free is a commission inquiry, duly set by the president with adequate terms of reference, not to go and particularly look at particular targets. ESCOM has got 50 billion per annum in coal. I mean, their own report, that is the basis of this inquiry, says that 50 billion annually up to the 2017 financial year end, that's how much they spent on coal. Now, how much did they actually pay to the Guptas? Is it even 5%? 5% would say it was 2.5 billion off the 50 billion. So where is the challenge? Is the challenge the 2.5 billion paid to a particular company, group of individuals, or the entire procurement mm. of coal? Yeah, no, then but I think the challenge to this, yes, yes, yes. And uh, please hold that thought. The challenge is in this is that had there been favoritism, unfair advantage, influence from the minister for the year Guptas to, uh, you know, she, she mentions in, in, in her uh, wit, uh, test, testimony that Optimum had become the pillar of the state of capture narrative, which, which is the Gupta Tageta owned company. So how then do you explain, is it explaining the in, inexplicable or is, is the committee not asking the right questions? Do we have the capacity to get to the bottom of this? Uh, no, I mean, I've said it many times, and I think if, if you look at even yesterday's lengthy testimony led by, uh, and, and the questioning led on by Mr. Brian Molefe, I mean, if anything, it was clearer than daylight that those members of parliament in that inquiry were hopelessly at sea. They were lost. And I, men I mentioned it before and I'm mentioning it again. Why did they, where were they in such a haste? Why did they not take time to go and familiarize themselves with the power system of this country in terms of ESCOM, which is an energy system? And why did they actually place so much reliance on the report that has been authored by Professor Anton Eberhardt? And that report, once again, I'm saying, that report cannot stand anywhere because it is not up to the standard that one would have expected to come from a professor. And we've challenged, of course, uh, Professor Anton Eberhard to come and defend his report. And I can assure you he will not be able to defend his report when we have to uh, go toe-to-toe uh, -to -toe with him. He's, he's going he's to be able to defend it, but be, be that as it may. Who is Professor Anton Eberhard? He was in the war room, and he happily enjoyed working in the war room that itself was unlawful. And even Minister Lynn Brown, you know, is going around it. But the issue is this, the war room was unlawful because ESCOM operates under company's law. It's an organ of statute. It therefore, there was no room for that interference. It was not even an intervention, even though they liked it to be an intervention. But the long story short is that that report and this inquiry, in my own assessment, having the historical knowledge and the experience of some of the characters that are involved, it is nothing but a ruse to bring about the collapse of ESCOM. Now, Cindy, Friday, we will have the credit downgrade. Next week, cabinet is sitting. Minister Len Brown would have done very well to tell us exactly who are the people that have been nominated to be on the board, the new board of ESCOM, which by all likelihood, because they said they will appoint before the end of November, it will be, those names will be presented to ESCOM. And I can assure you, the people that I have been suggested or the allegation that has been made and specifically on, on who will be appointed the new chairman of the board of ESCOM next week, that person already is conflicted. And the question that we, of course, have, got, have to have interest in finding out is that how did the Deployment Committee of the African National Congress actually approve 
of those persons and specifically the person who's been suggested to be chair of the board and more so as to who demanded that that person be appointed in order to avoid the liquidity or financial crisis of ESCOM. But after all, all of this thing is an orchestration to bring about one ultimate objective, that is to break up ESCOM, that transmission. There, there was a, a few years ago a thing that was thrown out by the ANC called the ISMO bill. Now that ISMO bill, after it was thrown out, they are now wanting to bring it through various guises. And one of the guys that failed in 2015 was to bring about business rescue proceedings on ESCOM. And it was none other than the author of this report that uh, triggered this inquiry, Professor Eberhardt, who himself, in fact, was leading in the war room the efforts to bring about business rescue proceedings, which was nothing again but a backdoor privatization of ESCOM without any benefit whatsoever accruing to the state, but for future financial hardship and economic hardship to the people of this land. So the question that must, South Africans must be aware is this. This is nothing but a ruse to justify the privatization by any guys, and we should not allow it because if we allow it, we will have no country. There are ample examples we've adduced to show that privatization everywhere else has never worked. And in fact, it would be unconstitutional to privatize ESCOM, but that is what is being attempted. All right, so we're going to have to take a quick break uh, and we'll return and go back uh, to Parliament and take reactions from our panelists, Sepo Khadima, energy expert, and Zamo Madlala is the spokesperson for Radical Economic Transformation Coalition. Earlier on, uh, Minister of Public Enterprises, Lynn Brown, uh, was in uh, Parliament testifying in the uh, ongoing ESCOM inquiry. So we'll go back to that in a bit. For now, though, we'll take a break.